Hi, I'm Paolo Blixtin from the TLT lab at Stanford. And I'm gonna start my presentation with a story. This is Eric, he was 12 and he built this system for saving energy in street lights. But his most ambitious idea which he, which he couldn't build was to generate energy from the car's movement through the speed bump. People made fun of his idea, you know, energy from a piece of concrete, that's just nonsense. But then five years later, I saw this on the news. And stories such as this inspired me to think very seriously about building and inventing in schools. And to build, you need tools. But lately, in the past 100 years, tools have become a bad thing. Today, they are things we hide because they might show we don't make much money. So what happened? When did we start to snub construction? And really, when you think about it, all kids think about is constructing things. Just look at any toy catalog. You see lots of construction materials there. But around the time when school gets serious, we tell them, kid, you should maybe stop playing with Legos. Don't even tell people you like that. Tell them you like reading and math, really hard math. That's the stuff of smart people. But even smart people don't know how physical things work. Just look at my iPhone. We don't know how it works. And in my research, I ask people to draw everyday objects and tell me how th those things work, just like, for example, thermostats. And those two drawings, as you can see, are very similar, except that one was done by a nine-year-old <laughs> and the other one was done by an undergraduate in an elite university with very well-paid gardeners. <laughs> so why not make building a serious part of school? promoted from shop class, from vocational education. And that's what we're doing with the Fab Lab at School project. So Fab Lab at School combines the ever decreasing costs of high quality fabrication tools like laser cutters, 3D printers, uh, flexible robotic kits, with the idea that construction should be a culture. And the way that we communicate that we really care about something is by building a place where that thing can happen. If we care about sports, we build a gym. We just don't give out sports kits to students. So basically, we renovated a normal classroom, and we put, it a, we put there a 3D printer, laser cutters, low-cost robotics, vacuum formers, lily pads, and lots of stuff from LIA. We trained teachers, we developed materials, and now we're doing research on those spaces. So what's different about those labs compared to other kinds of things people do it in school? Why, why spend so much money on these labs? Well, they allow kids to build things that really are sophisticated, things that, things that actually work, things that are products that can work in real life. And that makes all the difference. The quality of the tools, of course, shape the sophistication and the quality of your products, and also how you feel about your creation and how seriously people take you. So let's look at some examples in two main categories of projects. First, engineering projects that kids build to help the community, and projects closely connected to the science curriculum, which I call bifocal models. So this is an automatic page turner for kids with disabilities. And so this is the first prototype that was built by kids. And then the final version, which you see now, actually won a competition in Thailand in a, a competition for products for kids with disabilities. So you can see the page being turned. This, these two girls in Brazil, so one of them had a sister who had to come back and, roll and, and rock the stroller every five minutes. When the baby started to cry, she couldn't get anything done around the house. She had to come back every time and she, could do, she couldn't do any work. So the sister, the girl on, on the right, built a stroller that had a sound sensor and would rock itself when it detected the baby crying. And also when the, the diaper was wet with like a humidity sensor, it would send a, a signal to the mom. <laughs> so this is the, the final presentation of this project by uh, Jaini. So as you can see, the, the stroller rocks itself. It actually works. It's not, it's not a real baby there, but it... Uh... <laughs> and one of the fascinating things about this is how it changes the way people, and kids in particular, look at everyday problems. They don't look at those things as a given, but they look at those problems there as 
motivation or ideas to improve things. But kid, kids do other things too, not only technical projects. This student in Russia loved Bach and he created this flute with 12 servo motors and programmed it to, pay, to play real classical music and use it, uh, he used an inverted vacuum cleaner to blow air into the flute. And let's listen to this student from a 99% minority school in East Palo Alto who had been working in our lab for a couple of months. It's kind of scientific, but this isn't the kind of science I do so at school, so this is fun. But like biology and um, chemistry, not fun, but this is fun, so yeah, this is different. I think this is science though, probably, right? <laughs> like at school, we learn about like body health and organs and things like that. And here, we learn about how to create stuff using science, so it's a little different, it's funner. So the second type of projects we do in, in our labs I are tightly coupled with science, and I call them bifocal models. And bifocal models are uh, models where students have to build their own physical model, their own theoretical model on a computer, and connect them in real time to refine the theoretical model. So here is here an example of the gas laws. Students use the tools in the lab to build their own physical model, their own science labs, if you wish, and then build a computer model so they build their own validation system. And this is actually funded by cyber learning, this research. So those labs are not just for engineering projects, for the projects I just told before, but also to learn advanced science in this way. So we have these students in Russia who built a bifocal modeling about diffusion. You can see the physical model here on, on the left with sensors built using a laser cutter, a router, a vinyl cutter, and lots of th that kind of equipment. And then on the other side, the computer model, and they are connected in real time using a platform called Google Board, which is a low-cost serial, inter serial interface that I created. So students can refine their own theoretical models of diffusion uh, using these systems that they build themselves. This is another example of a bridge. Students were interested in calculating the harmonics of the bridge and at what point it would break. So they built a corresponding, the bridge on, on, on the right and then the corresponding computer model on the left and they were connected in real time so they could you know, increase the frequency of vibration until it breaks and, and test the equations and all of that. This is another example of a pendulum where you can this is a pendulum, then you can overlay on the pendulum the computer model, try to find discrepancies, go back, change your model of gravity, overlay the forces. So these systems, these bifocal models and these tools that we're creating makes it a lot easier for students to de detect discrepancies. And you can't build any of those systems without, without the right equipment. We're also trying to find, to, to make Fab Lab sustainable and scalable in schools. So th there are two infrastructural elements that I'm paying a lot of attention to. Assessment is one. So we're developing brand new forms of assessment, new instruments. We're instrumenting all of our labs with panoramic cameras, sensors, all kinds of things. We're using education data mining and learning analytics to understand data. And we're finding out a lot of things. For example, much of the difference between experts and novices is about how they take into consideration noise and error, which is something that we don't even teach in school. The second thing that I think is very important is curriculum integration. We're working with a physics teacher in East Palo Alto and building a whole year physics curriculum to be taught in a fabrication lab. And not just a study, but a real, a real physics course with real students, and it's been really great. We've been doing this for about four months. And so, oh sorry, assessment, curriculum integration. See, the slides are out of sync with the speaker. So, let's, this is the teacher, the physics teacher. Challenges or questions, and kind of allowing them to explore their creativity, explore their um, their own ideas of how to approach a problem. And this is one of the it students. It was really fun because you actually get to apply what you know. And before it was just like learning and learning. It's like everyone in the real world, like when I'm on a roller coaster, I think about physics and how high and fast it's going, and like it's just. It's a different way of looking at things when you're actually doing them in real life. 
So where are we? Well, um, we have labs in Moscow and California and many more to come. We have generated a lot of curriculum, a, a new professional development model. And we created and held the first FabLearn conference last December at Stanford, and we were 30% oversubscribed. And on October 2012, we'll have the second FabLearn conference at Stanford. At next AERA, I was invited to organize a presidential session on digital fabrication in education. And I'd like to end with this example of a nine-year-old girl that came to our lab for a fabrication workshop. And one of the things we do is to ask, uh, we, show, we actually show a picture of a window washer that's in a kind of unsafe situation. And we ask the kids, you know, how would you improve this situation? And this is what she answered, I don't know. And many other kids gave the same answer. And then she built, during this two-hour workshop, this very simple ballerina robot. And then we asked the same question again, how would you improve the situation of the window washer? And this is what she did. So of course, inspired by the, the window washing, um, uh, the, the ballerina, but a sophisticated robot that washes windows. And the amazing thing is not that she built this thing, but it clearly influenced her thinking. It changed the way she thought about the problem. And that's why I think just focusing on making things is exactly the wrong way. We want scientists and engineers, or at least citizens who think scientifically. As Edith Ackerman says, it's about hands-on, but also heads-in. And that's really our challenge as educators, merge the hands-on and the heads-in and have a place in schools where this gets elevated to a valued practice and make it happen not just for the 1% minority of self-selected kids, but for all kids. Build the labs and they will come. Thank you. <laughs>